Hello, this is Lindsay Clark, and I'm your primary instructor for um, Current Topics in Medical Laboratory Sciences. This is Lecture 17, and today we are talking about lab safety. So a large part of my master's degree focused on occupational and environmental health, and more specifically lab safety. So this is a subject that's very familiar to me. Um, it's one that I really enjoy, although I know that not everyone feels the same. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to make this lecture at least somewhat enjoyable for you guys. So our objectives for today's lecture, number one, recognize safe practices in the laboratory. Number two, list the agencies that regulate laboratory safety. Number three, describe requirements for laboratory safety as outlined in OSHA's Bloodborne Pathogen Standards. Number four, identify common safety equipment, primary barriers, and secondary barriers utilized in the laboratory. And number five, compare and contrast biosafety levels and properly classify biohazardous agents. So let's talk about what is included in lab safety. So this is a short list, um, a summary, and it's really more of an outline for today's lecture because there's a lot that goes into lab safety. So we'll start kind of broad with general lab safety. There's general lab guidelines, then fire safety, and chemical safety. I'm sure you all have talked about these things before, but we're going to review them today because they are very, very important. Then we will discuss OSHA's bloodborne pathogen standard. Everyone working in the field should be familiar with this, but again, we're gonna review it um, here today. And lastly, we are gonna to touch on biosafety. And this applies a little bit more to the microbiology lab specifically, but it has really great standard practices that can apply to many, many parts of the lab. So you guys need to be familiar with these practices. Um, they're called the standard microbiological practices, as well as the different biosafety levels and different types of biosafety cabinets. And we will talk about all of that um, in this lecture. Before we get into the safety details, let's talk for a minute about who actually regulates safety in the lab. So there are many different agencies that play a part in lab safety, and that includes OSHA, the CDC, the Arkansas Department of Health, or um, your state department of health for whatever state you may be working in, um, CAP, or whatever agency accredits your lab, and of course the Joint Commission. So each of these agencies kind of has a different role in regulating safety in the lab, and we're gonna talk about several of these um, in this, this lecture. So let's get into the safety stuff now. One of the most important, if not the most important safety rules is hand hygiene. This is one of the best ways to prevent the spread of infection. Laboratory personnel should wash their hands frequently and especially after removing gloves anytime hands are visibly soiled and always before leaving the lab. And think about this for a minute. You always want to remove your gloves and then take your lab coat off, then wash your hands anytime you're going to actually leave the laboratory, right? So if you wash your hands, then touch your lab coat to take it off, well, you've just contaminated your hands again. So make sure when you wash your hands, you've already removed your lab coat. It's very important. So the next general safety guideline is one you guys have heard so many times already. No food or drink in the lab, no smoking, no applying cosmetics, and that includes chapstick, and do not handle contact lenses in the lab. So food must be stored outside the lab in areas that are designated for that purpose. In other words, the break room. So keep your food and drinks in the break room. So this um, is generally not an issue for larger labs because they have that designated space, but smaller labs with limited space may have an issue with this. So where we've seen problems with this before, 
Um, if you are involved in any sort of point of care testing or going out to different sites that are using point of care testing or different units in your hospital, um, always check the refrigerators in those areas. So we have seen in many, many instances where nurses or medical assistants um, will store food or drinks in the mini fridge right next to the specimen. So Maybe that's the only refrigerator they have access to, or maybe it's the most convenient refrigerator they have access to, and they will stick their lunch in there right next to the rack of tubes full of blood, and it's gross, um, and maybe they, they don't realize it or it doesn't um, make as much sense to them as it does to us, but always be aware of that if you're ever working in that role. You always want to check those refrigerators. For food or drinks. So also there should absolutely under no circumstances be any mouth pipetting in the lab ever. I feel like I should not have to say this um, but I have actually witnessed this during my career. So there are some old school techs that uh, are med techs that have this is the way they've always done it, and that's the way they do it, and that's the way they're going to keep doing it um, until they either retire or die from inhaling whatever chemical they are sucking into the pipette. Um, there are so many devices now that are available to assist you in pipetting. Um, there's, of course, the bulbs that everybody knows and loves, but there's also lots of other devices that you can use. So there's the ones with the little rollers, and there's more automatic ones, all kinds of stuff. Um, whatever you have in your lab, just, just please use that. Like, just don't, no mouth pipetting, guys. All labs should have a policy for the safe handling of sharps, and this includes needles, scalpels, um, glass pasture pipettes, and so on. These should always be properly discarded after use according to your policy. All procedures in the lab must be performed in a way that minimizes the creation of aerosols. So if you believe a procedure you are going to perform will create aerosols, you should perform that procedure in a biosafety cabinet. And we'll talk about biosafety cabinets um, a little later in this lecture. And then also disinfect workspaces and do it often. Your workspace should be disinfected at the start of your shift, any time a spill occurs, and at the end of your shift. Um, always remember to use an appropriate disinfectant, um, which many of your labs will already have figured out what they are going to use and it will be available to you. And always remember to disinfect things like keyboards or the mouse or the phone, um, anything else that may be touched by someone who has also handled specimens. Um, be mindful of things that people have touched while they're still wearing gloves. Um, maybe they've worn those gloves, processed some specimens, and then went to look up some um, orders on the computer, and they, they didn't take their gloves off, and they're typing on the keyboard, and you come up behind them to use that keyboard next. Um, just be very mindful of that, um, and make sure those things get disinfected regularly, and that you're washing your hands frequently. We have all talked about the lab dress code before, um, but we're going to talk about it again. So always tie your hair back. I know on a good day it's a bummer, ladies, but it has to be done, okay? That's for your safety. And that goes for guys with long hair also. Now always wear closed-toed shoes in the lab, and we prefer that they are not canvas um, and that they are made of something non-porous, something like leather or patent leather is even better where you can disinfect those and clean them off should something drop onto them. You should not wear shorts or skirts in the lab. So many of you will wear scrubs, but some labs do allow you to wear street clothes that follow the dress code. In those cases, if you choose to do so, always wear long pants. So I know that girl that's on NCIS wears a skirt and it's real cute or whatever, but that's just not allowed um, in the real world. So please do not do that.
And as for PPE, you should at a minimum be wearing a lab coat and gloves when processing specimens or handling anything potentially infectious or if you're handling any reagents that may be harmful. Now your lab coat needs to be buttoned up and I understand that it gets insanely hot in the lab sometimes, especially with all those analyzers um, putting out heat, but it is for your safety to keep that um, lab coat buttoned up. Now any other procedures that you may perform that require additional PPE, you should always follow the guidelines and policies for that procedure. And you should do it because Safety Unicorn says so, but also because it's required. So we will move on to fire safety. Most of you already working in a lab will be familiar with RACE and PASS. Um, RACE stands for Rescue, Alarm, Contain, and Extinguish or Evacuate. So, if a fire occurs, you should rescue any patients or coworkers and get them out of harm's way if you are able to. Then, pull the alarm and contain the fire to the best of your ability. And that is often going to involve closing doors. Then, if it is safe for you to do so, you can extinguish the fire. And if not, then you also should evacuate. In the event that you do need to evacuate, um, of course, do not use the elevators, close doors as you leave the area, and in most cases, you are going to evacuate vertically, then horizontally. So if your lab is on the second floor in one area, you may move to another area, safe area on the second floor, and then go down to the first floor and exit the building. But always be familiar with what your policy says. Um, and be familiar with where your lab's evacuation plan is. Um, this is something that accrediting agencies can and will ask you. So um, in case of fire, again, always use the stairs, but um, you want to make sure you use them properly, right? If you need to use the fire extinguisher, um, you want to remember PASS, P-A-S-S. -S. And this stands for pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep. And it's a quick way to remember how to operate the fire extinguisher. So pull is pull the pin at the top, aim, aim the nozzle at the base of the fire, squeeze is squeeze the handle, and sweep is for sweep the nozzle back and forth at the base of the fire. So it's important to remember if you're in this situation, you always want to aim that and, and work at the base of the fire to try to extinguish that. So let me ask you guys, do you know where your fire extinguishers are in your lab? What kind of fire extinguishers do you have? And what is your lab's evacuation route? You should know the answer to all of these questions um, as your accrediting agency can and will ask about some of these. So if you don't know, um, next time you have a minute, walk around and find out, find these things. So fire prevention is also a major part of fire safety. Now ways to prevent fires include keeping flammables away from heat, make sure all plugs are grounded, and treat all chemicals with respect. In addition, if you are going to tinker with an instrument and try to repair it, you should turn it off or unplug it. And if it smells like smoke, unplug it if you can do so safely, and then leave the area and report that to a supervisor. Now you should also be aware of any requirements your accrediting agency has in the way of fire safety also. You should be able to find this information fairly easily um, in your lab. It's either in your lab safety manual or they will have a separate um, fire safety policy. So this is the National Fire Protection Association Hazard Identification Label. And you guys have probably all seen this label before. 
It was originally designed for emergency responders as a quick way to identify what they were responding to and what kind of hazards it may pose. Um, you will see these labels often on bottles or other containers that contain um, certain chemicals that maybe the chemicals have been transferred to that bottle and that label has been affixed to the bottle. So the label consists of four color-coded fields and a numbering scale ranging from zero to four, with zero being materials that are essentially non-hazardous and four being materials that are the most hazardous. So the red field represents fire hazards, blue is for health hazards, yellow represents the stability or instability of the material, and white is reserved for specific hazards such as corrosive materials, radioactive materials, um, things of that nature. It is worth mentioning that the number scale used with the NFPA or NAFPA diamond is the opposite of the one used by the globally harmonized system and we will discuss the GHS in just a minute. So it's a good idea to label bottles in the lab with this label to let employees know what they are working with. Um, this gives them a way to quickly glance and see what the substance is and how hazardous it might be. Um, always spell out what is in the bottle. So for example, and this is very common, if you are using ethanol in the lab, instead of writing ETOH on the bottle, you should always write out ethanol and you should always include the concentration as well. So chemical safety. Each lab is required to have a chemical hygiene plan that includes safety data sheets for each chemical used in the lab as well as training documentation. So you should be trained on chemical safety initially upon hire and that's before working with those chemicals and then you are required to be trained annually thereafter. So one of the important things with chemical safety is the right to know standard and that is a federal law that provides rights under OSHA's hazard communication standard and it states that employees have the right to know and understand the hazards they may be exposed to while working with chemicals. Under this law, employers are required to provide employees with information about chemicals and they do that through a written program which includes a list of hazardous chemicals, um, requires labeling of all chemical containers, it requires them to give employee, employees access to all safety data sheets for all chemicals used in that area, and it requires training workers about those chemical hazards. So beyond the training, it often falls to the employee to seek out specific information about certain chemicals. So safety data sheets are often going to these days be stored online. And while the written program is available, it is often not gone through in great detail with the employees. So the right to know standard is especially important for anyone who is pregnant or wants to become pregnant as well as those who are immunocompromised or on immunosuppressant medication. So if any of those are you and you're working with chemicals, you always want to be aware of any um, special precautions that you should take. So there are also several different classes of chemicals and I'll let you guys read through those. Um, what I want you to know here, it's important that flammable chemicals and corrosive chemicals have special containers to prevent um, flammables from going up in flames and to prevent corrosives from uh, first corroding the container that it's in and second melting your hands off. A key part of chemical safety is knowing how to store and handle chemicals safely. So in general, you should treat all chemicals as if they are potentially toxic. Chemicals need to be stored in well-ventilated areas. 
with acids and bases stored separately and flammables stored in a flammable storage cabinet. Those are generally yellow with red writing on them and that's where all of your flammable chemicals should be stored. So if you are transporting more than 1,000 milliliters of a chemical, it should be transported on a cart. You should not try to carry this through the lab. That's a recipe for disaster. Chemicals should not be poured down the drain. Um, they should be properly disposed of. And this usually happens through your occupational health and safety office or your environmental health and safety office, whichever um, one you have on your campus. So be familiar with their policies. Flammables and fuming chemicals should be handled in the fume hood and make sure that you're operating that fume hood properly. All bottles that have chemicals in them should be properly labeled. And that includes any bottles that have chemicals that have been transferred from the original bottle into a secondary container. Um, those secondary containers must be labeled. Okay, and again, you have to write out what's in there. You can't just put ETOH on the bottle and then everybody's good. No, you have to write out what the chemical is, be sure and add the concentration, and then you need to make sure that the hazards, um, potential hazards are on there as well. And in addition to all of this, an eye wash and emergency shower must be available to you in the lab. So this is another thing that accrediting agencies will ask about um, the eye wash or the emergency, emergency shower. Um, and they will check, those have to be checked periodically and documented that they were checked. They will check those um, logs as well. So always make sure those are up to date. So this is the globally harmonized system um, that I mentioned earlier, and that is the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals, often shortened to GHS, um, and it was developed by the United Nations to standardize classification and labeling of chemicals between countries. So in 2012, OSHA revised their hazard communication standard to incorporate the GHS. Um, this affected safety data sheets, labeling, and pictograms. So the GHS was responsible for standardizing safety data sheets, and previously these were called material safety data sheets, or MSDS, um, now just SDS. And they standardized those into 16 sections with a strict ordering so that no matter what chemical you are looking at the SDS for, it's in the same order with the same 16 sections. This really makes it faster for you to find out what you need to find out in an emergency because it's always in the same order. So the GHS also standardized labels for chemicals, um, which incorporates the pictograms that you can see here, the physical hazards, health hazards, and environmental hazards. And they chose pictograms as a way to sort of communicate across languages. So these can mean the same thing, um, and you can maybe see that skeleton that's for acute toxicity and maybe the writing is in a different language but you know that that pictogram means this chemical um, has acute toxicity. So I have uploaded several documents to Blackboard for you guys. I've uploaded a um, GHS fact sheet an OSHA quick card with a sample label on it. So it's a sample label that would be, for instance, on a chemical container. Um, there's also a fact sheet on the hazard communication standard pictograms, um, which are these GHS pictograms that are shown here, and it kind of explains what each one is for. There's an OSHA quick card on safety data sheets, um, as well as some OSHA briefs on labeling pictograms and SDS. So the briefs 
um, contain a little bit more information than the quick cards and fact sheets. Um, so just glance through those. I just want you guys to be aware that that information is out there um, and that it's available to you. These quick cards can be downloaded um, from the OSHA website and printed out and laminated and hung up in the lab if you need to do that, um, that kind of thing. But they're available for you here in Blackboard also. And lastly, there is an OSHA quick card that compares the NFPA diamond labeling system to the HAZCOM 2012 or the GHS labeling system. Um, and those are one and the same. The OSHA HAZCOM 2012 labeling system um, is the globally harmonized system. So they incorporated that and um, now call that the HAZCOM 2012. So I want you guys to be familiar with this one. Um, look at the differences and um, again, so the um, NFPA diamond has the numbers from zero, which is literally almost no risk, to four, which is the most risk. Well, the GHS, the numbers are opposite of that with one being the highest risk and four being the lowest risk. Um, so I want you guys to be familiar with that. Um, and then just look over that and be familiar with that uh, quick card and the information that is on it. Um, the rest, again, are really for your reference, um, are very good to look over and know kind of where to find that information. The OSHA Bloodborne Pathogen Standard should be well known to any of you guys working in a lab. This standard mandates that every lab has a written program for protecting workers from health hazards related to bloodborne pathogens. OSHA adopted this standard in 1992 um, and it has been in place since then. So another requirement under this standard beyond the um, the written plan is a, an exposure control plan, which is also a written program or policy that outlines um, protective measures the employer plans to take to eliminate or minimize employee expo exposure to blood or other potentially infectious material. Um, this is often shortened, other potentially infectious material. People just call it OPIM or um, sometimes you'll hear OPM, mostly OPIM. So the exposure control plan, it must contain at a minimum an ex employee exposure determination, uh, methods of implementation, implementation and control, hepatitis B vaccination requirements, exposure evaluation and follow-up procedures, procedures for evaluating the circumstances surrounding an exposure incident, and documentation for employee training. So the employee exposure determination section, that is going to outline in which job classifications are all employees going to have occupational exposure risk. Um, and then it will have a list of job classifications in which only some of the workers will have an occupational exposure risk. So for example, if you work in the lab, you will fall into a job classification in which all employees working in the lab will have an exposure risk. However, if you work for environmental services and maybe your area of the hospital to clean is the administrative offices, you may not have an exposure risk. But environmental services that are cleaning patient rooms or cleaning the lab, they may have an exposure risk. So they would fall into that second category of um, jobs in which only some of the workers will have occupational exposure risk. And then they're also required to list out what job tasks for those um, in job classifications where only some workers will have exposure risk, they're required to list what job tasks would, um, could result in an exposure. Now the methods and implementation and control section will have details about how the employer plans to keep employees safe. Um, and the rest of those I think are kind of um, self-explanatory on kind of what they're going to have in that in each section.
The exposure control plan is not required to be a separate document, so it can be included in the lab safety manual. However, it is required that it is reviewed annually um, or if any changes occurred. So we're going to focus on biosafety now, which is really more relevant in the microbiology lab, but many of these standard practices can apply to the whole lab. So I feel like it's important to talk about, um, not to mention some of you are working in microbiology and some of you will work in microbiology at some point in your career. So resources for biosafety guidelines include the CDC, um, Biosafety in Microbiological and Biomedical Laboratories book, um, pictured here, the cover, and it is lovingly referred to as the BIMBL. You'll hear people talk about the BIMBL. Um, another resource is the NIH guidelines for research involving recombinant or synthetic nucleic acid molecules. And this is commonly shortened to just NIH guidelines. And you'll notice the word research is in the title of the NIH guidelines. Um, so this is mostly going to apply to research labs, specifically those whose research involves recombinant DNA um, or rDNA. It is worth mentioning though, because some of you may go into research at some point in your career, or you never know uh, when recombinant DNA may make its way into the clinical lab and we will then be subject to these guidelines. Um, so I just want you to be aware that those are out there. But we are going to stick with the CDC BIMBL for this uh, lecture. The standard microbiological practices for biosafety level one are provided in your lecture manual. So they have been um, taken from the BMBL and put into your lecture manual because I want you guys to read through those um, and have quick access to them. So the highlights of those, um, and these are going to sound really similar to your general guidelines, um, restrict or limit access to your lab. There are door signs that are required, and this is more for um, research and micro labs where you are required to note that it's a biohazard area and which um, biohazardous materials you may be working with, what PPE is required, and so on, mostly um, for research labs. Um, you must wash your hands. No eating, drinking, smoking, etc. No mouth pipetting. Sharps policies are required. You must minimize aerosols. Um, now, this one, decontaminate before disposal, it really refers to microbiological cultures. Um, you, you are required to decontaminate those before you dispose of them. Some hospitals, microbiology lab will autoclave their own waste, um, and some hospitals will have somebody that collects the waste and autoclaves it um, before they take it to dispose of it. So it just depends on where you work, how that um, comes into play. Pest management plan must be in place and required training must be completed and documented. So I need you guys, again, just read through those standard microbiological practices in your lecture manual and be familiar with those. And again, those are for biosafety level one. As you move up to higher biosafety levels, and we'll talk about this in a minute, you will um, see additional practices added to that. So also in the BIMBL are details about biological safety cabinets or BSCs. There are three kinds of cabinets, class one, class two, and class three. Now biosafety cabinets are engineered to protect personnel and the environment. Class two and class three cabinets will also provide protection to the product, in our case, the specimen or the culture, whatever you're working with in the in the cabinet. So all biosafety cabinets will use a high efficiency particulate air filter, um, what we know as a HEPA filter. And all cabinets must be inspected and certified annually. 
So if you go into your micro lab or if you have a biosafety cabinet somewhere in your lab and you look at it, um, there should be a little sticker on it somewhere that will say that it has been certified by so-and-so on this date and that's required to be done annually. And then somewhere on there it will also tell you what class of biosafety cabinet you have. Most clinical labs are going to have a class 2 biosafety cabinet. Um, and the reason for this is a class 1 is the biosafety cabinet that does not provide protection to your, your specimen or your product, your culture, whatever you're working with. So you want to protect that um, and not cross-contaminate all of your cultures or your specimens. And so a class 2 is really the best option for micro labs. And then a class 3 is going to be a fully enclosed um, type of cabinet that has maybe the glove box on it um, that would really be more for like a biosafety level 3 or 4 situation. So the class 2 category is subdivided further into categories um, class 2, class 2 type A, class 2 type B1, and class 2 type B2. And the major difference in these is the amount of air that is recirculated into the cabinet and the speed of air flow. Um, so the image here that I've got um, on this slide is a cabinet that shows kind of the typical airflow pattern for a class 2 biosafety cabinet. And again, the difference um, in your different class 2 cabinets is going to be airflow speed, um, and how much air gets recirculated into the cabinet versus exhausted out. So notice the room air, um, which is the little kind of white or striped arrows, um, it's pulled in through the grate in the front of the cabinet. It runs under the workspace and up through the sides of the cabinet. So the polluted air, or the red arrows, um, from the workspace inside the cabinet also is kind of pulled in through that grate um, so it's not it's not allowed to come drift back out into the room it's pulled into the grate and it runs underneath the workspace and up the sides to that area that's marked B so that Mary that marks B is enclosed um, you will not have access to that area um, from there it is either pushed through a HEPA filter and back into the cabinet um, so the red arrows that are kind of pointing down towards the area marked A through that um, grid space, that's where your HEPA filter will be. It will go through there and back into your cabinet. Or the air in space B will be pushed through a HEPA filter and exhausted out of your cabinet. Um, again, that grid area there is going to be your HEPA filter. And the green arrows show you the HEPA filtered air and where it may go. The airflow for these cabinets is very carefully calculated to be the most efficient for removing possible contaminants from the air and preventing it from being recirculated back into the room. So it is vital that the grate remains clear of equipment, papers, etc., etc., um, in order to maintain that efficiency. So if your grate is covered with papers and that airflow gets messed up, you are putting yourself and your coworkers at increased risk of um, maybe any aerosols that are being generated inside that cabinet. So make sure that stays clear. Um, there are lots of mathematical calculations for the best place to um, put your biosafety cabinet, the airflow that needs to be there, um, how high the glass needs to be that protects you from splashes, all of that is very carefully calculated. Um, so make sure it remains clear and open so that it's working um, at the highest efficiency possible. Your lecture manual has a chart in it and that's going to, it outlines all the different types of cabinets and the differences between them. So I also want you guys to be familiar with that chart. I want you to take a look at it um, and see what are the differences between the different types of cabinets. And then next time you're around yours, take a look at yours and see what class do you have, when was it last certified, um, 
kind of just take a look at where is that grate, is there stuff on our grate that needs to be moved, um, that kind of thing. Just be aware. So we are now going to briefly go over the different biosafety levels that are detailed in the BMBL. So the levels go from BL1 to BL4, and sometimes these are referred to as BSL1 or BSL2 and so on. So that's, they both stand for biosafety level. Um, so BL biosafety level, BSL biosafety level, same thing. So if you see those two different terms, they mean the same thing. BL1 is going to be the lowest level and it represents the lowest risk. It contains agents of minimal hazard. So these are going to be things like a lactobacillus or non-toxin producing E. coli, stuff that can be worked with out on the bench. Your BL2 organisms are going to pose a slightly higher risk than BL1 and they include things like salmonella or Lyme disease. Now a lot of these can be worked on outside the cabinet on the bench, but some of them may need to be inside the cabinet, especially if there's risk of aerosols. Uh, most clinical labs are going to deal with BL1 and BL2 organisms. Um, BL3 organisms are higher risk than the previous levels and they um, include those that pose serious risk if infected or even lethal infection. So examples of those are going to be brucella or TB. Um, US, UAMS has one BL3 research lab and I know the Arkansas Public Health Lab has a BL3 lab. Um, they are not very common. I'm not sure there's any more in the state. Um, if there are, there's not very many. And BL4 labs are going to be the type of lab that you would see at the CDC. So this level represents the highest risk, the most dangerous organisms like Ebola virus or Marburg virus, um, things along those lines. Now to work with these organisms, you must be in the full suit with the positive air pressure. Um, you must work in maximum containment areas. So think about when you see um, TV shows and they have the full suit on and they've got the hose coming out of their suit and it's connected to the ceiling, pumping air in there. That would be a BL4 um, lab. The state of Arkansas does not have a BL4 lab at all. So that tells you they are not very common at all. So there's also a chart in your lab manual, uh, sorry, your lecture manual that um, will compare the different biosafety levels and you should definitely review that also. And just a note here, in the event that your microbiology lab thinks that they have a brucella growing out from a wound culture or whatever, um, they should, first of all, as soon as they think that might be the case, work up that culture in the hood. And then, as soon as they have maybe ruled out some of the other um, brucella species that are not biohazard agents um, and they think that it actually might be um, a special agent, then they need to stop working with that culture and send it to their public health lab um, for identification or confirmation. These types of things don't need to be put on the Vitec or if you are lucky enough to have a Maldi-Toff mass spec in your micro lab, there is risk of aerosoliz aerosolization on both of those instruments. So you should always try to make sure that you are not putting one of those agents on those instruments. Um, what happens then if you do that, whoever was in the lab that day gets to undergo um, routine testing for uh, quite some time as well as um, prophylactic treatment. Um, not fun, so just be aware if you work in micro, um, be aware of those, those things and be sure that you know how to tell very quickly this could be a culture I need to be concerned about. And if you don't know, it never hurts to work it up in the hood.
So the last thing I have for you guys for this lecture um, is safety equipment, primary barriers, and secondary barriers. And again, these are all discussed in the BMBO, which, by the way, can be downloaded in its entirety Excuse me, from the um, CDC website. If you just Google CDC, BMBL, it will pop up the fifth edition. You can click on it and there is a PDF download. Um, so if you're interested in looking into any of this or see exactly what it says about regulations, you can always download that um, and read it. Or if you need something to put you to sleep at night, that may, that may work for you. So anyway, safety equipment is basically the different components of PPE. So your gloves, your coats, face shields, goggles, um, so on and so on. And these are all items that are for personal protection. So what I really want you guys to know is the primary and secondary barriers. Primary barriers are engineering controls that are designed to remove or minimize exposures to hazardous biological materials. Now, this includes controls like biosafety cabinets, enclosed containers um, for maybe transporting specimens, and centrifuge safety cups um, that can help minimize um, aerosolization. Secondary barriers are those created through facility design and construction. So these contribute to the protection of laboratory workers, but also to the protection of public um, or the community, and it protects from infectious agents that may be accidentally released. So examples of secondary barriers include separation of the laboratory area from public access, so restricted access, special ventilation systems um, beyond a biosafety cabinet, uh, special air treatment systems, or even separate buildings to isolate the laboratory if that is required. So a situation in which that might be required, your public health lab that is tasked with working up potential biohazard agents um, or biohazardous agents that can be used as bioterrorism agents, they may have a separate building where they work that up. And that building may be very nondescript. Um, not a lot of people know what goes on in that building, and that's to prevent people from trying to enter that building to get access to things that could be used for bioterrorism. So that's a good example of when you might need a separate building. So make sure you're familiar with examples of these. So if I were to ask you in the future um, to give me an example of a primary barrier, you should be able to give me at least uh, one good example. So this is it for today's lecture. This one was kind of a longer lecture. Um, there's a lot that goes into safety. So I just want you guys to please always follow the safety guidelines in your lab. Uh, they can significantly reduce your chances of exposure or accidents. So as always, if you have questions, comments, or concerns, um, please contact me. And this is just a, a reminder down here, this image, that's actually Dr. Johnson uh, back in the day. He appears to be playing with dry ice. Um, this is kind of a reminder, like don't put your dry ice down the sink and play with it. It's probably not safe. He's lucky to still have a hand. So if you guys need anything, um, please let me know. And then here, of course, are your references for this lecture.